In today's video, we're going to talk about a framework for helping you ace your system design interview. So if you've got an interview, a system designer's view coming up with one of these tech companies, definitely give this a listen to the end. So today's focus is going to be on a six step framework and the aim is to help you get a strong hire. So you're going to aim for a strong hire and we're going to show you how, how to go about doing this from a strategic perspective. So I call this framework the TCP IPW framework. Sounds very similar to the TCP IP protocol from networking. That's intentional because it's easier to remember. So TCP IPW, so I'll explain what TCP and so on stand for, but just stepping back a bit. So if we think about your system design interview, you can break it down into phases. There's a requirements gathering phase, like what do I actually need to design for what well, the functional requirements, non-functional requirements, and so on. Then there's a the high level design, putting all the pieces together in terms of what components you need. And at this point, you're also thinking about, um, you know, the capacity and perhaps you need to do some estimation to uh, factor into your design. Um, and you're also thinking about some of the problems you have to solve. Uh, there's a deep dive, this is where you really um, dive deep into the core problems being solved and explaining how things actually work uh, given your time constraints so you can't even dive deep, deep dive into everything but you're gonna obviously deep dive to demonstrate depth this is what will help you really get a strong hire showing that depth of knowledge especially if you're a senior candidate and of course a walkthrough through your design showing that it actually satisfies all the requirements and just explain how it works so the framework is as follows so T time time allocation C, contract. The first P, prioritize requirements. The I, iterative high level design. P for prioritize deep dive. So we have two P's. They all refer to this idea of prioritizing things. And it's all about the fact that you have time constraints. You know, for a real system design, it'll take multiple hours. But in an interview, you're probably having to do this in an hour or 30 minutes or so. So you have to prioritize things. So we'll talk about that. And finally, the walkthrough. But one thing I just want to stress for those aiming for a strong hire, most of the time you want to spend in the deep dive, focusing on the core problems, how you solve them. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this a bit later. So this diagram just shows, it's almost like a, a heat map. I would say it's almost like, your interview is almost like a race to get to the point where you can do the deep dive. So you want to gather the requirements. You definitely should spend quite a bit of time there. So it's that's why there's a lot of red in this region. Um, and then you want to get to the high level design. Typically, this is really just standard. Uh, putting the standard components together, you just have to figure out what's relevant for your problem. Uh, we'll come back to that. Uh, estimation, if you need it. And then the deep dive is where you really dive into the critical sections, you solve the critical problems, and demonstrate that depth of knowledge. And of course, a walkthrough. Time allocation is important. You should go into the interview knowing, firstly, how much time you actually have for the system design. If your interview time slot is an hour, that doesn't necessarily mean you have an hour for the design. So it's always good to check with the recruiter beforehand, if possible, or at the start of the interview, ask the interviewer, how much time do we actually have for the design? Because some of that interview might be allocated for, you know, ask, asking questions. So for example, if you had an interview that was uh, 60 minutes or an hour, you should have a rough sort of time box for each of the phases. So it's like what you're working with, what you're aiming for. Okay, I have 15 minutes for requirements gathering. I have 10 minutes for the high level design, five minutes for the estimation, if relevant to the problem and needed, uh, 30 minutes for the deep dive because you really want to spend the time there. This is where you really earn your marks. Um, it was a 30 minute interview. So for example, the Amazon, they have one hour interviews and they do both leadership principles and system design in the same round typically. So you might have to go with something like this. Obviously, if a problem is just 30 minutes, then you're only gonna have so much time for the deep dive. So this is some framework you can use. You can use that as a basis in terms of your time split. It's not a hard and fast rule. You know, you might spend less time in one section and then have more time for others, but you need to have some kind of rough idea of, okay, this is about how much time I need for each phase. During your preparation, you should practice with this pacing. So when you're solving design problems under the time conditions you're preparing for, you're already, you're already forming the habit of spending the required amount of time in each phase um, that would allow you to finish in time. And even during the interview, you should also kind of track, you know, okay, after the 15 minute mark, you should be aware. So if you're still in the requirements gathering phase, you probably want to hurry up. 
So we've covered the T part of the framework, now we're going to cover C, which is for contract. And we're just talking about the requirement. It to be something you see as a contract. A common mistake candidates can make is actually designing, not designing what the interview is actually looking for. And one way to guarantee this is to essentially establish a contract with the interviewer explicitly. So the advice is, as the interviewer starts talking, just start taking notes on the key things they're asking for. If you need any clarification, ask them to repeat themselves. Don't be afraid. It's very important that you actually capture the key requirements. If you have any assumptions, thoughts, state them. Any ideas, suggestions, state them. Get that buy-in from the interviewer. And this thing about implicit assumptions is very important. Sometimes you solve the problem, but on the interview day, you might get something you've seen before, but it's a variant. A quick example is maybe you solve this popular problem, design Uber, right? And then on an interview day, you get the problem of designing a robo taxi service. One key difference between them is that the drivers, there's no human drivers in a robo taxi service, right? Self-driving cars. If you blindly just think, okay, I solved this design Uber ride sharing thing before, I'm just gonna kind of do what I did when I practice. Then you're gonna go off track. An interviewer might not, there's no guarantee the interviewer is gonna point this out to you. So this autopilot thing, you've got to be very careful. Um, force the interviewer to confirm that they're happy with the requirements you've gathered. You can ask and you say something like, um, is my understanding correct? Are this requirement what you're looking for? Which gives them an opportunity to object and say, oh, something is missing or you missed X, Y, Z out. It's very important because once you have your contract, then you can go off and do your design. So make sure they sign off. And you're gonna use this as a checklist once you're done with your design to prove that you've designed what they're actually looking for. Some problems are simple enough where you only have one or two key requirements and everything else is probably not important. So the key thing I just wanna stress is when it comes to requirements gathering, you wanna gather them in a prioritized way. So firstly, focus on the core requirements. What's so crucial for this problem, for the, for the design to work. And then there's some things that are probably some nice to have that you could do, but you probably don't have the time to do. So you should definitely employ a classification mechanism. I would recommend this must, must do, should do, could do, nice to do. Definitely the must do's are things you wanna get across in the interview, get done in the interview, should do's if you have time. Could do's are nice to do, you probably just wanna talk about them just to show that you're thinking about important things. It could be something like authentication, security related things, encryption and so on, but that might not be crucial for the problem. But just demonstrating yeah, you're thinking about this things is sending the right signals to the interview. And then you agree with the interviewer on what is a must do or should do. And maybe the others, if you have time, you know, you maybe could dive into them. Here's a template you could use. So you could already have this, uh, set up as the interview starts even before the interview starts talking you can set it up you know you have functional requirements on one side non-functional on another side your assumptions so as the interview talks and you're clarifying the requirements and you know having your thoughts you can lay them down put some classification um, if you say something's a must do uh, you can point it out to an interviewer maybe the interviewer disagrees then you can deprioritize but the key thing is this is essentially your contract and you want the interviewer to sign off on it. So essentially your, the conclusion of the requirements gathering phase is when you and the interviewer agree that, well, when the interviewer signs off on what you've gathered, they're saying, this is exactly what I'm looking for. That's not to say that during the course of the design, when you progress, you might not have some other thoughts. Um, if something's really critical and important, it might be something to raise, but generally speaking, you terminate the requirements gathering phase with the interviewer signing off and hopefully you shouldn't be adding anything extra. So, so far we've covered the TCP, T time allocation, C contract, requirements as a contract, P prioritized requirements gathering. Now we're in, into the IPW phase. So the I, the first I is, I mean it's the only I, the I is iterative high level design. And the idea is, unless you've really solved the problem before, you're not necessarily gonna have the answer just you know, flashing your head and you just paste it down. Um, there's there's a gradual process where the answer reveals itself. The more experience you have, the more likely it is that you'd, you you have fewer iteration cycles. But generally speaking with a high level design, you're thinking of 
what are the components you need and you know how they how they're going to interact so it's like a jigsaw puzzle with pieces and the standard components are you know the load balancers or api gateways queues microservices databases web socket that's a the type of connection you know caches generally general distributed system style infrastructure so obviously what i'm talking about is more, more tailored to like back-end design i know for like product related design so when you're focused on the apis um you, in some of those interviews you would know you would you know maybe do designing restful interfaces for example but generally the pieces are quite standard so what I want to stress here is you don't want to waste a lot of time drawing out all these things. You, you should draw it out, but you should do it very quickly, very standard. Okay, you have a load balance, you have a queue, or you have multiple queues. You have different data centers. You have databases. And at this stage, you're not actually thinking of what database you need. Like, is it going to be something optimized for reads or for writes. This is more just getting the pieces together, seeing what you need just based on the requirements. It'll be very obvious if you need to persist data so you know you need a database. For some use cases, you actually don't need to persist data. It doesn't matter if the data is lost, you can easily maybe regenerate it. We're gonna be adding more videos where we actually solve problems to basically solve common interview problems. So definitely stay tuned, You know, subscribe if you wanna see these videos so you can be alerted and obviously if you like our videos, if you like this video and you want to see more videos like this, definitely like, share, subscribe, helps the channel grow. So far for our TCP IP W framework, we've covered TCP I, so time allocation, contract, prioritize requirements gathering, iterative high level design. Now on the second P, which also stands for prioritize, but we're talking about the prioritize deep dive. This is where we've kind of been heading to, this is where you want to shine, this is where you want to show depth, this is where you impress the interviewer. So let's talk about how you do it. Now, for whatever problem you have, there'll be some interesting core problems. They're not even necessarily part of the, you know, functional requirement or non-functional requirement you specifically stated, but solving these problems will help satisfy those requirements directly or indirectly, let's put it that way. So it could be that you have to choose what database you want, because obviously you have to persist data in certain problems. Do you want a database that's optimized for reads? Do you want a database that's optimized for writes? So how are you making that decision? Are you looking at the data access patterns? Is it more reads is it than writes? Um, are you, what kind of database do you want? Is it a relational? Is it a graph? Is it a document store? Why? You know, you've got to justify these decisions, make the trade-offs. But firstly, what you want to do is present a menu to the interviewer. So it's a menu or problems. It's like, you're gonna say, okay, these are the core problems I think we need to solve. And you prioritize them in order. You let the interviewer know your thoughts. You present that, this must come from you. And once you show this to the interviewer, you can then negotiate with the interviewer. Like, okay, get them to reveal which ones they care about. Because typically, interviewers will have some problems that they wanna see. And if the candidate takes those boxes, then they'll be happy to pass them. So if you've demonstrated that you can identify these problems and explain you know, why this is a problem, why it's important, then the interviewer is willing to kind of work with you to say, okay, you know what, just talk about these two. Again, you're time constrained. Maybe you only have, hopefully you have 30 minutes for this or maybe 10 minutes, it depends on the interview. So you can then know which one the interviewer cares about or which ones the interview cares about and then you can focus on them. I appreciate some of you might still be early in your journey of the system design prep. So I'm gonna try not to be too technical here, but there's this idea of consistency of data. And it could be that you're trying to configure what consistency you want. Maybe you have a data store, it's a database, it's a Redis cache, whatever. And you're deciding, do I want strong consistency? Do I want quorum consistency? Or some other, one of the other consistency models. And perhaps if you have strong consistency, that might mean that, so let's say you had a single write so a node for writes to your data store and you had multiple read replicas, this is kind of a standard configuration. Maybe if you opted for strong consistency, it means that anytime you write, this you have to wait for that data to be propagated, so replicated to all your read replicas. If you have quite a lot of replicas, that might mean that takes a lot of time. And if you're doing this write synchronously, that could have some impact on the latency of whatever your service is doing. Whereas if you go for quorum consistency, you can say, actually, I only want a quorum, so it's just a subset of these writes to, to occur. 
And once that's the case, I know how to do my reads to make sure I'll always get the latest data. Because one of the reasons why you want strong consistency so that if you read from any node, you're always getting the same consistent view, the same data. There's no situation where, so to give an example, maybe you're looking at your bank account and your balance is $100. And maybe you do a transfer of 50, so you should have 50 left. And maybe you go on, go to your mobile phone and you log in and you still see you have $100, whereas on your desktop where you did a transaction, you see you have $50. Maybe because the backend database is involved and not in sync. If you had strong consistency, you wouldn't have that issue. Um, with quorum consistency, there's, I'm not going to dive into this. That maybe that's a topic for another day, but you can make sure you don't have to wait for all your read replicas to have this data propagated. You you just need some subset of them, and you never have this um, issue of inconsistency because of the way you do the reads. We're not going to dive into that. So anyway, the, the idea is you present whatever the problem is, present the solutions you're considering. Why solution? What what are the pros and cons of each solution? If I pick a certain solution what are the trade-offs I'm making and then you just justify your decision like why this is the preferred option that's a deep dive and then you move on to the next one if you have time the next problem and do rinse and repeat by the time you're done with this deep dive really you should be at the point where the interviewer has a good idea of if you've passed or not and the final thing I'll recommend you do especially if you have time is do a walkthrough so it's a sequential kind of step-by-step -step walkthrough of how your design works so just think about the user and how they use your service. Maybe certain requests, certain flows, and explain how that how those flows work. Okay, the user does this, then a the request goes to this component and goes to that component, and and so on and so forth. Also cover edge cases if you have time, and you're doing this with the view of showing that you are satisfying the requirements, so the functional requirements, and as you talk through your system also talk about how you're satisfying the non-function requirements. So for example, if you've decided to introduce a Kafka queue or RabbitMQ, you can justify how that's helping you deal with scalability challenges based on the amount of load you're expecting or the number of users or requests per, per minute or whatever. So you're essentially using this requirement, this contract that we started with as a checklist. You signed off with the interview that this is what the, you want the system to do, right? You want it to satisfy these functional requirements. You want it to satisfy these non-functional requirements. You stated certain assumptions, which the interviewer has confirmed or objected to. And then you're then walking through your design saying, hey, you know this requirement that we agreed on? I tick, I've satisfied this. I've satisfied this. I've satisfied this. Oh, this one I also could do or should do. We didn't really get time to do it. But if I had time, I'll do X, Y, Z. That's the end. You started with a contract and then you proved you satisfied the contract. That's pretty much the approach. So if you enjoyed this video, you found it useful, like, subscribe. If you have mock interviews coming up or you just want coaching in system design or even other domains like coding, behavioral, and so on, definitely check out coaching.com. We can help. We also have a lot of free system design related content. So we're working on a system design demystified course. It's still in the beta phase, but there's a lot of free content. So definitely check it out. There's even some solutions to problems that have been asked, uh, which you can check out. 